Welcome back to Mentorit TV. Today we're going to have another episode on COVID-19 from crisis to creation. And I'm very happy to welcome Nani Falko Bekali. Not only is he my husband, my beloved husband, but certainly one of those people that have shifted the needle when it comes to corporate life. He is now the CEO of Falco Enterprises. He's also senior operating executive of Ron Capital and he's chairman of ASK Chemicals, member of the boards of Neovia Logistics as well as Covestro which is a spin-off of Bayer and he's also previously of course made his name and his fame as the international CEO working for GE for over 40 years. Nani, thank you so much for joining us here on Venture TV. Thank you, Patricia. It's a pleasure to be here. Nani, I really would like to pick your brains on the corporate side and drill a little bit deeper how this crisis is impacting corporations around the globe. You have been with GE for 40 years. You've always been a corporate man. Then you became an entrepreneur, but now what you're doing in your current role, you're restructuring in the corporate sector, individual companies that are in this name, make them good, valuable, and then sell them again. Now tell me a little bit, first of all, the environment as you find it over the past few weeks due to COVID-19. It's a very, very difficult environment as you can, as you can expect. Uh, Point number one, it arrived as a surprise. And I think that here we have to point the finger collectively at the institutions, at ourselves as business leaders, because the first signs of this pandemic were not recognized as a pandemic. Of course, we arrived late. And the preparation for a situation like this one came in late. As a consequence, we are paying the price right now. Now, we have seen, personally, I have seen few crises. And I have seen them from a position of leadership in a large corporation like General Electric. I have seen the September 11. I have seen the 2007, 2008 economic crisis. And I'm seeing this one, even if I am not in my privileged chair that I used to be, that I used to have in General Electric, but I'm still in a position where I can see a lot of factors that are playing a role. One important thing to consider is that even a crisis like this one, despite what people try to say, is not going to change the human behavior. We have seen it in September 11. Few things changed. We travel in a different way. We don't get on an airplane anymore as we used to. We have to go through security and so on, but we quickly, quickly adjusted to that. And as a matter of fact, the volume of travelers before the pandemic was much, much bigger than the volume of travelers in September 2001. We have seen it in the banking system and in the industrial system after the 2007-2008 crisis, where Everybody at the moment of the crisis was saying things are going to be dramatically different. There is going to be a totally different behavior. No, there is not a different behavior. Some things have changed. Banks have been required to have more of a safety buffer in order to protect against another event like this one. But on the other side, the essence of behavior of people has not changed. What I see here today and you know, I think that I can predict is that we're going through the crisis in this moment for major corporations and for smaller companies, cash is the king that there is. You see airlines flying airplanes with an occupancy factor of 30% is a losing, from an income point of view, is a losing flight but from a cash point of view, it generates a little bit of cash that can allow the airline to survive, besides the help from governments and so on. I can easily predict that we are going to have a couple of years of adjustment 
a couple of years of shakeup. Mm. That we're going to have some people that are going to predict that human mankind is going to change. But I can tell you that things are going to go back to where they were before. People will travel, maybe with some constraints, maybe with a mask on the face, maybe with a pair of gloves, maybe with, with... Human mankind is adjustable. You know, the, the, the survival of the fittest is not the strongest to survive. It is the one that can adapt to the situation in the best way. Now you're asking me about companies. Mm -hmm. There are going to be companies that are going to suffer very much. I said before, cash is king, cash is fundamental. Companies that in one way or the other can generate a certain amount of cash to bridge this position, to bridge this moment, are going to survive. Companies that on the other side do not have that possibility they are going to perish and we will see a lot of companies to perish but let me let me just um sure. stop here for a moment and go exactly into that when you say okay humans will be humans they will not change and i've seen crises and i've seen the behavior not really change i think when it comes to the cash positioning there are lessons to be learned because what i'm hearing what you're trying to say with the cash is king that whoever has got a good financial buffer um, has got cash provisions will be a lot more resilient in these kind of shocks that are unexpected let me give you the example of private equity uh, private equity in this moment is many of the private equity firms have a considerable portfolio a considerable cash portfolio and in this moment they can look at many opportunities that are out there of companies that are in difficulties that are either underperforming or that are finding themselves strapped by the throat because of the cash situation and they can come in with a considerable amount of help support and gain positions equity positions in companies that maybe two months ago were absolutely not available i'll give you an example that is strictly related to my activity we have invested, uh, it ended up to be at the end of last year, so it was pre-crisis, but we have invested in an oil company, oil service company, a uh, small one, not a very big one. Um, and in this moment, the opportunities are there to use this acquired oil service company and looking around into the space that they are occupying and see how many other similar companies in the same kind of general activity are there and are going to be in great difficulties. And so this is going to be represent an opportunity because as a private equity firm in this moment, we do have a sufficient buffer, shall we say, so we can go out and make acquisitions. And as a matter of fact, we are looking for making some acquisitions in this space. So this is where the crisis to creation actually um, is a very valid um, example to go forward. And I think we had Steve Schwarzman, who is the CEO of Blackstone, saying exactly that. Valuations in these kind of crises of companies out there will go down because of whatever management was there before. We have 150 billion US dollars in our coffers and we are like, planning to spend it, which of course is an opportunity, the opportunity because money is coming into um, into the system. On the other hand, you have just um, out, I think, yesterday, a McKinsey study talking exactly about that. You have private equity and you have the companies that private equity is after. And value, value creation within these companies is extremely important, if not more important than the actual price of getting in cheap. Yes, you need to get in cheap, but the value creation, once you get into the company, needs to also be fundamentally strong to weather crises or black swan events much better than others. To what extent are you actually applying this when you go in and build companies up again? It's very true. And you see, if I speak from a personal point of view, I, as you mentioned, I grew up in a corporation like General Electric, that is a corporation that sets a considerable amount of values. They are ingraining values in your brain. And, you know, you live by those values because if you don't live by those values, you're going to be fired. And so that's the end of your career. 
Arriving in private equity, and especially coming from the position I was in general equity, my intellectual search was the one of looking for the responsibility that a private equity firm can have in the panorama of industries where they are operating. One thing is the creation of value for the investors and for the shareholders, and it is fine. But the other thing is also to take companies that are either not well managed, not well financed, not well, okay, and address the issues and make sure that those companies are going to be well managed, well financed, in good shape, which means, and it represents saving work, saving labor, saving people, helping people to maintain their working capabilities. So the image that private equity has, and there are unfortunately some firms that, uh, that, that fuel that kind of image, which is the one of the raiders come in, destroy, uh, and, and increase value only through some financial engineering and so on. It is true in some cases. But it is not, if you want, the real purpose that in a social system the private equity industry has and where the private equity industry can really create value and benefit. You know, I grew up with the mentality that you need to satisfy a certain amount of constituencies, mm -hmm. you need to satisfy your customers, yeah. you need to satisfy your shareholders, you need to satisfy your employees, and you need to satisfy the environment in which you're operating in. And these are four principles that major corporations are working with, are living by. And this is something that I'm trying to, to implement and to instill in the businesses that I'm working with, in the firm I am with. And I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I'm chairing three, three companies for, uh, for them. And I'm trying to make sure that the companies that I'm chairman of are going to live by these, by these principles. But I think this is a very good point. Um, you're alluring to uh, human values. And I think the way in value creation within corporations, what are corporations? It's a, you know, you have the structure of the company itself, but then what makes a corporation different uh, to the others apart from its product is the people. And I think uh, there's no better person to talk about leadership and how to instill fundamental values in your daily modus operandi um, as a part of a company, uh, considering in your day-to-day -day life, not only shareholders, but stakeholders. How do you see that? If, how difficult is it for a manager, for a leader right now to keep the motivation up, to instill maybe better values going forward? I mean, leadership is, uh, is a very interesting concept, and I have been uh, lucky in my times, in my career, to meet an incredible number of leaders. So I could really try to abstract from each one of them what is one important characteristic that makes them such a great leader. And I came to some conclusions that leadership is an art, is not a science. Mm -hmm. There are no fixed rules that are determining the good leadership from the bad leadership. Yeah, there are a certain amount of basic principles, there are a certain amount of basic values, but there are good leaders that operate in a certain way and there are good leaders who operate in a different way. And it also depends very much, it is an art because there is not a playbook that tells you how to do it. And it also depends very much on the environment that the leader is operating on. A political leader has to operate in a certain way which is different from the industrial leader. A religious leader has to operate in a different way from other leaders that, that he is compared or confronted with. But the characteristics, the good characteristics of the leader are the clear definition of a vision, the setting up the strategy and the processes that are going to allow you to get to that vision, motivate the team, and one important factor is listen. Some of the best leaders that I met in my life are people that were listening 
some of the worst people that I met, some of the worst leaders, not people, leaders that I met, were people who were hearing you talking. They were not capturing the meaning. Now the vision has to be simple, but inspirational. Now let me challenge you on that part. Please. Part, if I may. And, and let's keep it with a COVID crisis situation. Now the leaders, how much, you know, what clarity do they have? How it's going forward? How can they say, this is our vision right now. Um, we're going to, yes, we have to cut stuff or we have to go into, a, you know, a program where we are being actually supported by government uh, um, financial help. How do you create that vision going forward in a very uncertain environment? Let's look at two examples that because of the media we have under our eyes on every single day. I'm talking about American examples, but these people that we see through CNN, BBC, various news. Trump on one side, Cuomo on the other side. Trump is a narcissistic, egomaniac with the principle of dementia. It's not me saying it, it is people who are specialized in the psychological in the industry. And everything he stands, every time he stands up and everything he says is me, myself and I, and his aim is to be reelected in November. And it's so transparent and it is so clear that is really upsetting somebody like me. You look at Cuomo on the other side. And to Cuomo, the, um, the, the governor of... The, 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 governor, the governor of the state of New York. He is... Trump is confusing. His message is one day we go right, the other day we go left, maybe we go in the middle. Everything is terrific, everything is great but people continue to die and people continue to get sick. You look at Cuomo on the other side, he is honest, he gives you the facts, he gives you the truth, he tells you where he cannot do things and is very clear about that. He tells you where he needs help and he gives precise indication to the people that are oriented to the benefit of the people. Yes. Now, tell me which one is the better leader and better of the two. Well, I think that we know the answer to that. But you're talking about transparency, basically, and really yeah. situation-orientated rather than personality-orientated when it comes to whatever message is uh, going out there. Exactly. So we we're talking about the vision, you know, being simple and inspirational, but understandable. People need to understand where, where they're going. And if there are doubts in question, say, there is doubt. And the vision needs to paint a picture that is challenging, but attainable. If you paint a picture that's too easy to get, you know, you end up into a mushy kind of environment. If you paint a picture that people look at it and they say, yeah, that's impossible, we, we cannot do it you cannot motivate the team to get there. So <clears throat> the challenge has to be there, but there has to be something that people realize they can attain, that they can attain. When we talk about strategy and process, once you set it, one of the important factors is the relentless monitoring of the progress. Yes. And in this, I went to the school of Jack Welch, which used to be the chairman of the board or, and, and CEO of General Electric. And he was a person that was following up every single initiative that there was. And he was writing you these notes with a black marker on the letter, we, we still use that at the time, on the letter that you were sending with questions, with uh, appreciation, with further, further ideas and initiatives to do and all that kind of stuff. So you could rest assured that when you had an initiative in your organization 
and that Jack knew about it, you were going to be followed up. And then there is a the motivation of the team. It is the principle of the stick and the carrot. You have to reward and you have to be forceful enough to punish when things are not going in the right way. And the rewarding is always easy because people like to please. The, the, the stick portion is the most difficult because it is always very difficult to sit in front of somebody and honestly and candidly and fairly tell the people, sorry, you are not doing what you're supposed to do. You know, we tend to, we tend to candy coat it when we have to give a bad message. We say, you didn't do this, but. That but ruins completely the message of that you didn't do this and you didn't perform. But most important, what I consider to be the most important factor of leadership is, is a service. You know, the pyramid needs to be turned upside down and the leader is at the bottom of the pyramid. Too many people arrive on top of whatever and they think that the world owes them. And they think that now they can do whatever they want, that people are just nothing else but servants to their needs. I think going back to Trump, it is a typical example of that kind of mentality. Mm. Everything for me. Everybody is serving me. On the other side, if you're a leader, you're paid more than anybody else in the organization. You have more benefits, more compensation, more services. You know, for many years, I had the possibility to utilize private airplanes. I mean, private airplanes is a wonderful way of travel. And it was a perk, but I used it because it was helpful for the benefit of the company. The longest day of my life was a breakfast in Tokyo, the inauguration of a locomotive manufacturing facility in Astana, in Kazakhstan, and a dinner with Emir of Abu Dhabi. You can do this if you have the means to do it, which is you fly in a certain way. I would have never been able to do it on a commercial flight. So, I had that benefit, but you have to use that benefit to the service of the, co of the institution you're working for, to the service of the people you're working for. And there is one other point which I think is important for leadership, and it is you need to be humble. You don't need to be cocky. Too many examples of people, and again, I hate to keep on mentioning it, but you know, Trump is the typical <laughs> Can we kind of like balance out <laughs> a little bit? Okay. No, you know what you think about Trump, but perhaps give us also a, a um, example of who you think really juxtaposes him and does the right thing and is humble and in the service of the country rather than himself. Because you see, one of the points is the people who are humble are not so well known and recognized because they are humble, but they do a fantastic job but they are not going to go out, look at me, look at me, look at me, and, and, and this kind of stuff. So, you see, we aim at Trump because it is such an easy target that everybody sees and everybody can recognize that I know I'm becoming boring because I keep talking about him, but that represents for me the, the example of what I want to talk about. Yes, no, but I think it's, it's a actually a really good point you're mentioning. And I think this is the kind of, you know, crisis always shows you the true leader, the value in friendships uh, or any kind of structure, even in a company, it shows you the cracks. And just to circle back um, in order to wrap up our, our conversation as well, Nani, is, you know, General Electric and other big corporations, they have their growth playbook. Let's play growth playbook. You are in charge of many companies. You're leading your own company and uh, you are a chairman of the board of some. So you are in this leadership position. The growth playbook going forward, what you could actually see and also share with other leaders is what do you see? What do you prepare for? And how do you really communicate with the people you're responsible for in these corporations, how things are going to perhaps shift? Maybe not long, long, long term, but in the Term, and where you were talking about this flexibility and trying to fine tune on a regular basis becomes really part of um, a value creation process. 
the vision. We are getting out of this one. Few things will be different, but business will be as usual. Might take some time, but we are going to get there. How are we going to get there setting the strategy and the processes? We are going to get, get, we're going to get there through a certain amount of actions and activities. Okay, private equity, we're going to save cash. We're going to, to acquire companies in the space that is close to the companies that we have and so on. You set the processes in order to get there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please make sure that we're going to do that and we're going to do it in this, in this way. You motivate the team, there is going to be a major reward for all of us at the end of it. The first reward is we are going to be alive and kicking. Biggest, biggest reward that there is. Survival. The second reward is that we are going to make a considerable amount of money. The third reward is that we are going to save jobs for a lot of people. And these three things should be inspirational for attaining our results. And then let's listen to what the people have to say. People are going to come and say, I cannot do it. I'm hurt. Yes, I know. I understand. But come here. You are hurt right now. How can we solve the problem of your hurt? How can we help you? What can be done in order to resolve your problems? And again, you have to listen, listen, listen. Thank you so much for being with me here on Mentor at TV and giving a little bit of transparency and out of the box thinking and visions what this crisis could really create going forward.